All right, Genesis chapter 1. That's where we're going to start tonight. This series of tough topics begins with this idea of image of God. And the reason that we're beginning here is because every person has a life that consists of relationships. This is what life consists of, right? That all of life consists of three relationships in particular. So we've got a relationship with God. Everybody has a relationship with God, whether they acknowledge it or not, whether they have a right relationship with Him or not. Everybody has a relationship with God, right? Well, we also all have relationships with other people, those we surround ourselves with. I mean, even if you're a hermit who lives out in the woods, right, you have a relationship with other people. Now that relationship's at a distance, right? That relationship is a do not trespass sign, but you still have a relationship with other people. And then you have relationships with the world around you. So the animals that we pet, uh, the porches that we step off of and hurt our ankles, um, the cars that we drive, the wind that blows in our face and blows that hot dust, you know, when it's like 102 outside. So we have relationships with the world around us. So these are the three relationships that all of life consists of. And if you think about it, every moment of your life, and I'm, this is a bold claim, every moment of your life is spent in relationship to one of those three, right? Every action, thought, thing that you do is an interaction with one of those things, okay? And so part of this Tough Topic series is to give you guys tangible things that you can use to navigate through those relationships. Primarily the first two, your relationship with God and then your relationship with others. Those are the primary relationships that we deal with, and then those dictate the way we relate to the world around us. So we're going to spend most of our time over the next five sessions talking about what it means to relate to those, uh, relate to God and relate to those around us. Now, um, we're going to cover three general and broad topics, but we're going to get somewhat specific in each of them. Today, we're talking about image of God, which deals with human dignity and it deals with abortion. So we're going to talk about both of those things. Next week, we're going to be talking about something that may be a little closer home for some of you. We're going to be talking about depression. We're going to be talking about suicide. We're going to be talking about self-harm. Okay? So those are topics maybe, maybe you've dealt with them or you know someone who's dealing with them. So we're going to talk about those things next week. And then later in the summer, on July 10th, we'll come back and we'll start a series. Uh, it'll be a two and a half part series on sexuality, gender, the body, pornography, all those different things. So we're going to talk about all of those tough topics from a biblical perspective. Let's let the Bible define how we engage with all of these different things. So that's the goal. Now, I expect you to have questions, okay? Most of these topics bring questions from even people who've been studying them their whole lives, okay? So there's a couple of ways in which I want you to be able to ask your questions. The first place you can ask your questions is your parents, okay? So as we're talking about these things, I want you to make notes, and then you can go and ask your parents what they think about it. Because we believe that your parents are your primary disciple makers, okay? That they're the ones who are in charge of your spiritual development. Now, your first inclination there might be, oh, I have to talk about spiritual things with my parents. I have to talk about God with my parents. That seems really awkward. And maybe in some of you, it's not just awkward. Maybe that's painful, okay? Maybe that's difficult to have those types of conversations with them. But I would encourage you to press through that, press through that pain, through that awkwardness a little bit, and begin to have those conversations, okay? But if you don't feel like that's an appropriate outlet for you to be able to ask your questions, in the seats around you, or maybe in the one you're sitting in, there's white pieces of paper, okay? You can write down your questions on here. There's pens at the back if you need to go grab one. Uh, I would encourage you as in the middle, don't wait till the end, in the middle as you're hearing things, write down your questions. And then you can drop that in the basket on your way out. And then on our fifth night, uh, July or August 7th, we're going to spend part of our time answering some of those questions, okay? Some of the questions that pop up about what it means to be made in the image of God, what it, what, what suicide includes and depression looks like or um, what, what biblical sexuality is like. If you all have those types of questions, write them down, drop them in the thing on your way out. Or let's say that something sparks in your brain, hey, I'm dealing with this now, okay? This is an issue I'm facing with and I don't know if I can wait till August 7th to get an answer to my question or I don't think my parents can answer my question. Come find a leader immediately after the session, okay? 
your leaders are here to love on you, to serve you, to answer your questions, okay? So at the end, if you have just this burning question that can't wait, go grab one of your leaders. And we would love, more than love, to have those conversations with you now. Cool? Does that work? Okay. So where do you go first with your questions? Your parents, okay? Where do you go next? Cards, box. You can use these cards if you have a slip of paper in your own notebook. You can drop them off in the basket there. And then where do you go third with your questions? Media leaders, right? Leaders around you, adults you see in the room. Grab them and we will talk about those things, okay? Any questions there? All right, so let's start off by talking about image of God. Before we get to any of the questions that we're going to discuss, the tough topics that we're going to discuss, before we talk about human dignity, before we talk about abortion, before we talk about depression and suicide, before we talk about um, sexuality, we have to get this idea straight. That humans are made in the image of God. We have to define what humans are and why we were made. And so we're going to start where the Bible starts, at the very beginning with creation. Because regardless what you believe, whether you believe the Bible or not, your belief system has a beginning. It begins somewhere. And we as Christians, we uniquely believe that our history begins where the Bible's history begins, when God creates everything. And so we see in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we go on to realize that that heavens and earth includes all things in creation. It doesn't just include this particular planet, and, but it includes the entire universe and everything therein. So God existed alone, and then he creates everything else that exists. So he is the creator of all things. So nothing exists without him. So God goes and he begins to create everything else. He creates water, he creates the sun, the stars, he creates the birds, he creates the animals, he creates the fish, he creates the trees, he creates land, he creates all those, not necessarily in that order. He creates all those different things, right? But then we get to the creation of humans. And the creation order kind of takes a pause, okay? We've been moving at a pretty steady pace, a pretty fast clip, you know, just one after the other, day after day after day for five days. And then we get to the sixth day, and then Moses, who's writing Genesis, he slows way down really quickly, okay? So Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. <clears throat> then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds in the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the things, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so we get to this point in creation where God creates man. And when I use the word man, I'm just using the biblical, world for, biblical world word for human, which incidentally is Adam, okay? So Adam's name isn't arbitrary. It means, it means man in Hebrew. But when the Bible typically talks about man, it just means human, okay? Male and female. And so we see that God creates male and female and in some ways, he's created them just like he's created everything else. It's just the last thing he creates. But then we see in which it's not like everything else. This man is different than the rest of the image and how, or the rest of creation. And how is he different? How are they different? They're made in God's image. So what does it mean to be made in the image of God? It's one thing for us to read, okay, man is made in the image of God, created in God's likeness. But what does that really mean? Because... I'm in the likeness of my father. I mean, when I was young, I can't tell you how many times I would get from people my dad grew up, oh, you just look just like your dad. I'm sure a lot of y'all get that. You just look just like your mom. And so we have the likeness of those who gave birth to us, right? But what does it mean to be made in the likeness of God? Well, here's just a really short and helpful definition. To be made in the image of God means that in some ways we are like God, and in some ways, we represent God, okay? In some ways, we are like God, and in some ways, we represent God. So there's that two aspects, to be like God and to represent God. 
And we see that in the text that we're reading, right? Let us make man in our image, in, after our likeness. And so just the language here gives you this idea of like a picture or a sculpture or something. A picture of someone else. So if you looked at the picture, you realize, okay, that's not really that person, but it looks like them. It acts like them, it talks like them, it behaves like them, but it's not really them, okay? As much as I may look like my father, as much as I may talk like my father, as much as I may like some of the same things that my father likes, I'm not my father, but I'm still made in his likeness. So, what does it mean, mean to be made in the image of God? What does it mean to be made after his likeness? Well, first, it includes our function. What we do. And what's the function we're given in the text? And let them have dominion over the fish, birds, the heavens, livestock, all the earth, every creeping thing that creeps. Okay? So the first thing that this creation is commanded to do is to have dominion, which means to rule, to reign. It's kind of kingly language. Okay? As though these are lesser kings under a greater king. That this greater king is setting up these lesser kings all around his kingdom to rule under him. So it, people aren't confusing, okay, there still is the main king, the high king. He's above everything else. But now he's got these governors. He's got these viceroys, okay? He's got these ambassadors who live out in the kingdom and reign on his behalf. And what are we reigning over as people? Well, creation, right? I mean, he lists everything, and then in case he misses something, he says, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, you know, even bugs, as much as we may like that. All right. But from this text, do we see any of this applying to any other part of creation? I think the answer is no, that this is a unique role. Uh, one article I read put it like this, and I thought this was really helpful. Lions are powerful and kingly, but they don't rule over cities. Dogs run in packs, but they don't have relational communities. Dolphins are smart, but they don't do philosophy. So we see in which we are separated from the rest of creation, just given this name, and just by our function. We are made in the image of God, there we function like God in ways. So this is why, this is the way that God created all things. And look now in verse 31. And God saw all that he had made. And this includes the way that he'd set it up, okay? Not just the way he made it, but the way that he set up what he'd made. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So this was God's design from the very beginning. God had made man and woman, and he told them, rule over everything that I've created. That's your job. You're going to be my representatives, my ambassadors, and you're going to act in my stead, Okay? God's still in control, but he's saying you are going to rule, you are going to have dominion, you are going to reign. But if you've read your Bible, if you know Genesis, you know that this description of very good doesn't last very long. Things go from very good to very bad very quickly, right? I mean, we don't even have to go two more chapters before things go into the pit, before it is a total dumpster fire, right? Adam and Eve, what do they do? They disobey God. They've, got, they've get, been given this command to take dominion. And then they're given one off limits, one prohibition. Don't eat from that one tree. Okay, you got this gorgeous garden with as many trees as is pleasing to the eye, with fruit that's pleasing to eat, but there's this one right in the middle. Don't eat of that. And what do they do? They believe the lie of this crafty serpent that reveals himself, and they eat and all of creation, not just Adam and Eve, but all of creation is thrown into a curse. Um, but the question becomes, okay, God created things, and it was very good, and including they were made in his image. So is that done away with? Are humans no longer made in the image of God because we sinned? And it's not just an Adam and Eve problem, it's an every one of us problem. Okay, so does our sin disqualify us from being made in the image of God? That's the question that we then have to ask. Is this done with? Well, the Bible gives us a couple answers. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, excuse me, Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. 
Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For, okay, so we've got this idea of this relationship. Notice, we're going to see in a couple of verses that we read that the biblical authors are dealing with these three relationships that we talked about, right? So this is considering the relationship between two people. So, if you shed the blood of a man, by a man shall his blood be shed. For, the reason for, the ground of this reality. For God made man in his own image. And so this is a breath of fresh air if you're reading the Bible. Because you see, okay, God has made man in his own image. That's great. But has that been done away with? But then now we get to chapter 9 and we realize, okay, it's not all's lost. Humans are still considered to be made in the image of God. Well, some people may say, well, that's Old Testament. That's old news. Jesus, doesn't Jesus do away with that? Well, we come to James chapter 3. You don't have to turn there. It'll be on the board. With it, bless our Lord and Father. This is talking about our speech, our relationship with the way that we use our tongue before God and before others. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people. Okay, so this is talking about the dangers of the tongue. We curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Now notice in both of these passages, the author is not isolating this idea that people are made in God's ima image to be God's specific people. So in Genesis chapter 9, he's not saying only Jews are made in the image of God. And James, likewise, is not saying only Christians are made in the image of God. Rather, if you shed the blood of whoever, or if you curse whoever, made in the image of God. So this is for all people, regardless whether they believe or not. And so this is good news for you. This is good, for you, good news for you right now. Because it means that you are made in the image of God. No matter what your life has consisted of to this point. No matter how great your life has been or how terrible your life has been. No matter the pain that you've experienced or the joy and bliss that you've experienced. We all share in this fundamental reality. We are all made in the image of God. And so we've got a couple of implications for what that means. Okay? So what does it mean? What does it mean if all humans are made in the image of God? What does that mean for how I consider other people? Okay? Well, first, it means that humans were made for a purpose. God doesn't do anything just for the sake of it. God doesn't ever decide to do something just to see how it will turn out. Oh, this will be a fun experiment. Let's see what happens. If I drop this on Hal's head, let's see how he responds to it. No, God doesn't respond that way, right? God does things for a purpose, including his creation of an image bearer. Now, we'll use some of that language in, in here. We'll use it some of that, some of that language in uh, the Sunday morning service. You'll hear, bear the image of God, to be an image bearer. It means that you are made in the image of God and your fundamental role in the world is to represent God. Now, there's ways in which we can use that well and we can misuse that. And to, mis and to misuse that is the nature of sin. To take the good things that God has given us, primarily that we've been made in his image, and to misuse it. But it still comes to the point where we have to realize all humans, whether they understand it or not, whether they use it rightly or not, are all made for a purpose to glorify God. See, one of the common activities, we've talked about this even uh, in the big picture that we went through in Sunday school, that during the Old Testament, it was common for kings to make images of themselves and set them out inside the kingdom. In fact, I sent out a video to some of your parents this last week. They have a link to it. And I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll post it on the, on the Instagram and the Facebook page. But it talks about how kings during this time would make images of themselves and they would set them up all around their kingdom. That way, their servants, their citizens would look and be reminded, oh yeah, he is the king. Well, Israel was unique. They didn't make images of their God or their king. And they were specifically told not to. Uh, Exodus chapter 20. Who, who knows what's Exodus chapter 20? Commandments. Ten commandments. Very good. Okay. Exodus chapter 20 is the ten commandments. And the second of those commandments, 
Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, if you know the Ten Commandments, then you know the commandment right before this is you shall have no other gods before me. So what God is saying is not only shall you have no other gods, I'm your only God, but you can't make images in any way representing me. And there was a reason for this. It wasn't that God was just kind of like, well, let's, let's make you different. But rather, it would be redundant because what had God already, God already done? He had already made images of himself. And so to try to make an image of God is to do something that God has already done for himself. So when we make idols then we take the place, of, then that takes the place of what we were supposed to be. God's representatives, God's images, the sign that when people look at our lives, they would know God is the ruler of the world. So, my question to you is, are you fulfilling your purpose? When people look at your life, do they realize, hey, God's the ruler of their life, so God must be ruler of the world. That's how it's supposed to work, and yet because of sin, it so often doesn't. So our purpose is to represent God, to image him, if we make that a verb, right? To image him. But the second implication, and the one that deals a little more with how we relate to others, that first one, we do a lot more self, self-inspection there, am I fulfilling my purpose? But the second one is that humans are made with dignity, And that word dignity means worthy of honor, worthy of respect. All humans are made with dignity. And this dignity, this worthiness of honor and respect, is not because of anything that we do. Because more often than not, because of our sin, because of our own pride, our actions fight against that. Give us reasons not to be dignified, not to be respected, not to be honored. But our dignity is not derived, not based on what we do or what we can offer. But rather, our dignity, the worthiness of honor, is based on who we're made like. So we're worthy of honor as humans, as individuals, each and every one of us, because we represent God. And so this is true of you. It is always true of you, regardless what you have been told, regardless the way you've been treated. Regardless, maybe ways that you have been dealt with with your family or with your friends, this is true of you. Regardless the ways that you've chosen to live your life, you are worthy of dignity, honor, and respect because you are made in the image of God. And this isn't just for the powerful, but also for the weak. This isn't just for the rich, but also for the poor. This isn't just for Christians, but for non-Christians. This isn't just for the able, but also the disabled. Not for the fully grown, but also for the baby in the womb. Every human is made in the image of God and therefore deserving of honor, respect, and dignity. This even crosses genders. Male and female are both equal in this. Male is not more in the image of God than female. We see that clearly in Genesis 1, right? What does he say there in verse 27? So God created man in his own image. And again, that man there is meant to include all of humanity. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so right from the beginning, we have this announcement that both male and female are made in the image of God. And this would have been radical for this day and age. Because for people to claim that females were the same as males, deserved as much honor, dignity, and respect, would have gone against every culture that ever existed. Even in some of the ways that our culture tries to say, okay, females are equal, but so often our culture fails in saying that. Well, we as Christians who believe the Bible ought to be the best at saying male and female, both are made with equal dignity, honor, and respect because both are made in the image of God. So this is why, even in our fallen world, even when we're dealing with people who can offer nothing or have done wrong with what they have, all humans deserve dignity, for they bear the image of God. This is the picture of the kingdom that the king set up. He set up his images all around. And if you can imagine for a second, living in a kingdom where there's physical statues reminding you who the king is, can you imagine 
the audacity and the act of treason it would be to try to take down one of those statues? I mean, you can just think of, you know, guys like Nero and other, other monarchies and kings and pharaohs and Caesars and every other power. Whenever their image is defamed, well, there's anger, there's wrath, there's retribution, right? Because you're denying who's in authority their place in authority. Well, it's the same thing whenever we deal with others in an improper way. When we treat each other without the dignity, honor, and respect they deserve, what we're really doing is we are offending that person, but we're also offending God. Because what we're saying is, God, your image bearer is not worth dignity, honor, and respect. The one you have set your image on, the one who represents you, they're not worthy of my respect. So, this is why things like abortion and euthanasia are such a travesty, okay? Euthanasia is mercy killing, okay? Like someone who's 80 years old who doesn't want to live anymore. This is becoming more popular, especially in uh, European countries. For people who are, old in age, who, are li- who are old in age to say, you know, I've lived a good life. I'm just going to perform a medical su- uh, medically assisted suicide, okay? That's called euthanasia. This is why abortion and euthanasia are such travesties. Because we believe that humans are made in the image of God. Then to end a life, no matter how young or how old, for unjust reasons, is not just an end to the life. But it's an attack upon the image of God itself. And so, therefore, babies in the womb are deserving of protection. Because they too are made in the image of God, even though they're vulnerable. And you might hear some people say, I've heard this pretty often. Well, you can't kill a baby in the womb because they might grow up and do something great. Okay? They might grow up and they might cure cancer. So we can't end a life because we could be ending the life of the person that'll cure cancer. Or we can't end a life because they may grow up and they may you know, be president one day. They may achieve great things. And that may be true about that life, but that's not why the life is deserving of honor, dignity, and respect. Okay? The life is worth honor, dignity, and respect because they're made in the image of God. And that's the same for you. You too, regardless what you contribute to society, you are made in the image of God. And so we must dwell on these things and realize that humans are made for a purpose and humans are made with dignity no matter what they do. Now, With these two ideas that humans were made for a purpose and made with the dignity ever present before us, this is the framework in which we're going to consider our topics over the next few weeks, okay? We can't consider self-harm and suicide rightly unless we understand this idea of image of God. We can't understand a biblical view of sexuality unless we understand the image of God properly. And so we're going to dwell on these things and we're going to return to these ideas week after week after week, okay? These things are going to be ever before us. But I would fail in my task if I didn't point to the ways in which God is making what's wrong right. So we've already established the image of God is maintained. But it's distorted, right? How many of us would be able to say with confidence, yes, I represent God rightly at all times, I use every good thing that God has given me and I return it in honor and glory and service to him as he is due. Yeah, none of us can say that, right? So that means that even though that image-bearing quality, the fact that we're made in the image of God still exists, that something's still amiss. Something still needs to be restored. And it's kind of like a mirror in one of those fun houses, right? The mirrors that make your head either look like it's three feet long and your body look like it's about this big, okay? My, we, we bought a cheap mirror for my son for his playroom so that it wouldn't break, but it's all warped and whatnot, so it's functionally like one of those funhouse mirrors, and so my son and I will stand in front of it and we'll make goofy faces and things like that. But the image is still there. Like, I can look in that mirror and say, okay, yeah, that's, that's still me, right? But it's distorted. It doesn't look like it's supposed to. Well, so what is God doing to restore that image? So that there is a clear picture. So that the image is clearly seen. Well, what God is doing is he's sending not just another image bearer, but he sends the very image itself. 2 Corinthians 4.4 In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ 
who is the image of God. And notice the difference there. We've been talking about all night how we bear the image of God. We display the image of God. But Jesus is the image of God. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. We'll spend a little more time in this text. Colossians chapter 1. And this will be our last last text we'll turn to for the evening. Verse 15. So what is God doing to restore this image? Colossians chapter 1, 15. He, speaking of Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So we in our relationships with each other, deserve to give each other honor, dignity, and respect because we equally bear the image of God. But there's a relationship in which we don't deserve dignity, honor, and respect, and that's our relationship with God. See, we were told, we were given a task to bear His image. We were given good things to be able to do it, and yet we have just trashed it. We have disobeyed God. We have disregarded His ways. And so we don't deserve dignity, honor, and respect from Him. We deserve wrath, condemnation, judgment. We deserve to be cast away. But instead of doing that for lowly image bearers like us, instead of doing that, He sends not just another image bearer, but the image bearer, His only Son, Jesus. Jesus, who deserved all dignity, honor, and respect, even from God himself, because he is God. But yet he didn't receive that. He received wrath, judgment, condemnation, to the point where Jesus is on a cross, bleeding, about to die, and what does he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's rejected when he should have received full acceptance. And what does this achieve? Well, it makes peace by the blood of his cross. See, we owe a payment to God because we were image bearers that did not live up to the task. But then the image came and he lived up to the task in every way, obeyed God completely. And he paid our penalty provided we trust in him. And so that's what Colossians is telling us here. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And what did he do with this reality? Through him to reconcile, to make things right to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once, old reality, once alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. I mean, that's all of us. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. So what Jesus does in the Gospels, he takes the image that we have trashed, that we have tried to tarnish to the point of of no longer recognizing what it is. Jesus supplies the penalty and he wipes it clean. Then he presents it before his Father and his Father looks at us who trust in him and he says, that is my pure and right image bearer. They bear my image rightly because my Son has earned it for them. They trust in my son. And the good news is, when we unite ourselves with Christ, we become more and more like the one whom we image. I'm just going to read a couple of these verses. 2 Corinthians 3.18 
beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image as Christ from one degree of glory to another. Romans 8, 29, For those whom he pre -knew, or foreknew, he is also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Colossians 3, 10, We have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And so, when we as Christians talk, you might hear us pray, or you might hear us talk, I want to become more like Jesus. I want to be more like my Savior. And that's what all these passages are saying, that this happens for the Christian. That we begin to image the true image of God, Jesus himself. We image our Creator, the Word of God itself. And then, as we wait till Christ returns, we wait with hope. That when Jesus returns for his people, no longer will it be a distorted image, but it will be without blemish. It will be perfect. 1 Corinthians 15, Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. 1 Corinthians 3, 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. Notice there's this aspect in which he's looking forward. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. Let's pray.